happened to I was about to keep promote that now and it's gone. Alright, well we're back. Um, we're gonna start to the conference has been unmuted. The conference has been muted. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Melchiski, and I'm a parent consultant with the Parent Information Center of Delaware. Today's presentation is titled, The ABLE Act and Special Needs Trust. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. During today's presentation, all lines will be muted. At the end of the session, as time allows, lines will be unmuted and open for questions. At any time during this webinar, you can type your questions into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Today's presenter is Diane Jones. Diane Jones is a certified financial planner who is the founder and president of Special Needs Planning and Resources. She is a Delaware native and have, has deep roots in advocacy in the disability and mental health community as a parent, advocate, professional, and agent for positive systems change. She incorporates person-centered planning techniques while assisting families with special needs financial and estate planning. She began her career in financial services in 1990 and since that time has accumulated more awards and honors than I can possibly list in a one-hour webinar. Welcome, Diane, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Diane, are you with us? The conference has been unmuted. Carrie, are you hear me? There we go. Apparently, okay. because I muted everyone, you were muted as well. I apologize. Thank you. No problem. Carrie, thank you so much for having me today. And thank you to the Parent Information Center um, for always getting such great information out um, to, to families here. I'm really excited to be back um, again. It's been a, a little while since I've given a web webinar, um, but I'm Certainly, uh, with the Parent Information Center, I'm certainly happy to be here today. And very excited uh, because I have some new information um, to share with families. I know we have a lot of questions about the ABLE Act and how they're different from special needs trusts, et cetera. And uh, so we're going to keep on time today and wrap up at 1 o'clock. Very quickly, I'm going to give you a little bit about my, about my background. Um, you know, uh, business-wise, you can find information about me on my website, but I really want to tell you who I am and why I'm here. Um, it was about 10 years ago. Um, I have three, three children, actually. Uh, my oldest is 23. I have one who's seven, and I have one who's four. Uh, so I've, I've spaced my family out. Um, but my oldest daughter, when she was in middle school, was diagnosed with a disability, and I realized that all of the planning that I've done, uh, had done at that point for her, actually was not in line uh, with the services and benefits and the supports that she needed to be healthy and successful. 
And uh, so at that point, I uh, rearranged my practice um, to include special needs planning after a lot of training. Um, I have actually trained a few hundred financial service professionals across the country um, on special needs planning. I've done the whole conference circuit with special needs planning attorneys and other financial planners um, with this uh, experience. And um, I'm here in Middletown, Delaware is where my office is. Uh, so that is where my passion li and lies. And I've been actually a financial planner for the last 25 years, um, specializing in, in special needs planning for the last 10. So I wanted to uh, go through the slides here with you today. Um, we, I do see a chat box, so if anyone has a question, uh, if you want to, I think you can raise your hand or type a question. And I'm going to see how we can get to questions as we go. So you don't have to wait to the end. Of course, I'll also give you my contact information. So if, if you have a question that you didn't want to ask publicly, uh, you can feel free to do that um, privately and, and confidentially after our, our webinar today. So with that, uh, we will get right into it. I'd like to uh, mention that I am an investment advisor representative and representative of Nationwide uh, Securities and Nationwide Life Insurance. My firm is Special Needs Planning and Resources here in Delaware, not affiliated with Nationwide or subsidiaries. And I'm going to add one uh, more thing. I may talk about certain scenarios or how families could consider planning. Please do not change any of your planning um, or construe anything that I, I talk about today as advice. There is no cookie cutter solution. When we talk about special needs planning, otherwise I, I always say I would have just written the book and I would have it out on the internet for everyone to see so they can uh, you know, consider how their planning should be done. I will speak of some possible scenarios, but I'm not speaking to anyone in particular or suggesting that it might be good for you. My, my role today really is to give you some information um, so you can see what's out there. And at the end, if anyone would like to uh, sit down for a confidential intake meeting, I'll be certainly happy to do that. But my role today really is to provide information to you. Three different uh, areas of, of special needs planning, or futures planning, as it's sometimes called. And uh, we have a financial side, which is where I come in. Um, there's the legal side of the planning. I am not an attorney. I'm not giving legal or, or accounting advice here. We're going to go through some legal documents. And then also creating a state and a state. I have three children, um, one with a disability, uh, two who I don't know if they have any disabilities today. Uh, the answer is no. But I have very different, in my family and my plan, I have very different goals in my estate for how I'm going to leave things to my three children. Uh, for my oldest daughter, I have some plans that could include uh, being able to financially have resources available for her and not uh, preclude her from obtaining government benefits or resources if she needed them for her lifetime. Uh, for my younger two children, um, my husband and I have a, a goal of helping with college and, and you know, maybe a wedding or something like that, and, um, and certainly with my third daughter as well, but very different. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're not planning to leave things for, for those two children to financially uh, sustain them through their entire lifetime. So. For those families who say, well, I don't have, uh, you know, if I, if I take a look at my balance sheet or what I have, if I don't have enough today where I can carve out a specific piece and set it aside for this one person in my life who has a disability or a special planning need, um, and I think that I want to have it there for a just-in-case, well, that's another area um, where financial uh, professionals like myself in special needs planning can help families do that and actually create an estate if one doesn't already exist. Uh, moving on, I wanted to start off with wills and trusts um, because this is going to build into the Special Needs Trust and the ABLE Act. Most people uh, understand what a will is, or their understanding is that it's a legal document that says, if I am no longer here, I would like my stuff, whatever that might be, my assets to go from me to someone else. And for married couples, often uh, we, we you know, lightly call them, I love you, honey, will, Wills. I love you, honey. If I'm no longer here and I'm married or have a partner, I'm going to leave it to you. 
and um, and you're going to do the same in your world perhaps to me. And then when neither of, of us are here, if we have any children or charities um, or organizations would like to leave it to, then that's how it will go. And that's how most people think of a will. Uh, what a lot of families uh, don't understand about a will is that uh, there's a very important part of a will. I hear some people come to me and they say, well, I don't think I need a will. I don't think that I have that much stuff. Um, but uh, one thing I want to point out is that a will is the only document that you can nominate a backup guardian for any of your minor children. And in Delaware, that age is 18. So if you have any children under the age of 18, the will is the document uh, that you would put in there that I would like uh, this person to be the guardian of my children if I'm no longer here. Uh, you know, of course, a judge would get involved to, to make sure, um, you know, something happened and someone had a three-year-old and they were no longer here. If the time came uh, when, when that three-year-old, when they set up the will, if that child was then, say, age 16, uh, the judge would make sure that that nomination that was done uh, when the child was a toddler was still a good person. Um, to be a guardian, or if that person even still wanted to be the guardian, or was even still here. So that's why the, you see the word nominate. Uh, it's a nomination, and uh, it's not always set in stone, but that's where you would uh, nominate a guardian. Wills are probated. Uh, we could do a whole workshop on, on wills and trust, but I'm just going to breeze through this kind of quickly so you get an understanding of the document without doing too deep of a dive. Um, and uh, a will is different than a trust in that a trust is private. Uh, a will is a document uh, that is public record. So in the news journal or whichever paper you read, you might see these public notices. Um, and they might say the estate of Diane Jones is open. And uh, for people that might have any claims that um, they say that I owed them money prior to my passing, um, creditors, et cetera, um, could take a look at the estate. Um, there's also fees, et cetera, um, in probating a will. A trust, a living trust, is a different document. It's, it's, uh, it does the same as a will in that it is a set of instructions on how to deal with property. A trust does not name a guardian for a child. The will is the only document that does that. But a trust is different than a will. It avoids probate. It's private. It's not public record. Um, and you also get to name someone uh, after you to manage the trust. That person is called a trustee. If you have a will, that person is named an executor. So uh, there are two different documents. Uh, some people might have a will and a living trust. It's not one or the other. Uh, some people, you, you can have both. Um, and that will can happen, uh, can make assets transfer from the person who's passed um, to the beneficiaries. Fairly quickly, uh, fairly quickly that happens. And a private estate means that no one knows exactly who got what and what the value of that was. And uh, particularly uh, when we know when you know certain people are, are financially victimized uh, more often because we see the studies and the data than others, um, that might include people who are seniors, uh, people who have disabilities, Sometimes uh, it's not a family's wishes really to have a public record as far as how much someone might be receiving from their estate. Moving on to government benefit programs. And this is important because when we talk about special needs trusts and we talk about the ABLE Act, um, it ties into government benefit programs. So let's just talk about them very quickly. Um, as far as government benefits, there are entitlement programs. Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI. That is uh, an income that could come to me if today I experienced a permanent disability. I could apply to Social Security for, for disability income every month. And based on my earnings over the years, uh, there's a calculation. If I look at my Social Security estimate, uh, they used to send those to us in paper. Um, now we, we log on to SSA, like Social Security Administration, SSA.gov. If you're not sure what your Social Security benefits may be, you can log in there. 
and uh, pull up your Social Security statement right there. That SSDI income, if I was approved, uh, that income is actually what we call an entitlement program. I'm entitled to that because every time I received a paycheck and every year I filed my tax return, um, I had paid into the Social Security system. That's why the word insurance is used there with SSDI. Uh, it doesn't matter if I hit the lottery and I had $20 million in my savings account, I would still receive that check from Social Security. If I paid in, I was eligible, and uh, I applied and they, they said that I did, in fact, have a disability. Two years later, uh, Social Security, if I was eligible for SSDI, two years later, um, I would also receive Medicare, which is a health insurance program. Uh, Medicare is health insurance that most people think uh, is for seniors over the age of 65. It's also for adults with disabilities uh, who are receiving SSDI as well. So those are entitlement programs. Those are not programs that this type of planning is looking to protect because there is no asset limit um, on the individual applying. They, it doesn't matter how much they have in savings um, or how much they own, if they have a disability and, and they qualify for SSDI, they would receive that. Uh, so I just want to make uh, sure that we understand that that is not the benefit we're looking at um, protecting for individuals who, who do, in fact, need government benefits. Not everyone with a disability does, of course. Uh, some do. The Affordable Health Care Act uh, is uh, another government benefit program. Um, and that health insurance, uh, that was the Health Insurance Act that required us to uh, cover our dependents to age 26. Uh, not, excuse me, that allowed us to cover our dependents to age 26. And uh, since that time, we have had other, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, which has come into place to, to bring uh, health care uh, to more people and make it more affordable. Now, moving on. Here are the needs-based programs. Needs-based programs are very different. Um, and we certainly can. I see a question. Are we going to have access to the handouts after the webinar? We certainly can. Carrie, I'll, I'll get those slides to you and, and uh, you can uh, email those out. Thank you. The needs-based programs uh, are very different. You have to need them to get them. So to need them, you have to also financially qualify. And these are the benefits that families are looking at uh, in protecting if, in fact, someone with a disability may need them. So needs-based benefits. A lot of people have heard of SSI. That's Supplemental Security Income. Not insurance. Income. Supplemental Security Income. In 2015, that check could be up to $733 a month for an individual um, and $1,100 a month for a couple if they are both married and eligible for SSI. Um, as long as an adult uh, receives at least a dollar of SSI, they also get Medicaid, which is health insurance. And uh, for children under the age of 18, uh, some children under the age of 18 with disabilities will also receive SSI, and uh, that is based on their parents' income. And we can see uh, for an adult under the 2015 limits, uh, the 2015 limits for an adult uh, to receive SSI, they cannot have more than $1,090 a month of earnings. We call that SGA, Substantial Gainful Activity, if you hear Social Security talk about that. Um, if someone is blind, then they can actually earn more every month. And then a trial work period is, is uh, for people who are receiving benefits, SSI benefits, go back to work. Um, and they're, they don't lose their SSI right away. And again, we could do a really deep dive into these benefits, um, but not the agenda today. But I wanted to let you take a look at the types of programs that special needs trusts and, and uh, ABLE Acts are looking to protect. In addition, you see under the needs-based programs, some people will receive food stamps. Uh, we call that EBT in Delaware. They might get an EBT card um, to um, purchase food. Women, infants, and children, WIC, 
Uh, that's a program for infants and pregnant moms um, and, and children up to five. Housing vouchers, sometimes they're uh, under HUD. Uh, housing and urban development, Section 8 vouchers, other types of housing that is subsidized by the government. Those needs-based programs say that you can't have more than a certain amount of income um, or assets. So let's take a look at the assets. To qualify for those needs-based government benefit programs, your countable resource limit must not be worth more than $2,000 for an individual. And if there is a married couple and both of them have a disability, <laughs> combined they can't have more than $3,000. I'm not sure where that math came from. Um, <laughs> you would think it would be four. It means a low limit. Um, but for a married couple, they can't have more than $3,000. And uh, these benefits, uh, and I believe 1984, don't quote me, is when that $2,000 limit was put into um, the reg because they were, they were designed for people who had little or no assets. And uh, those needs-based government um, programs will not allow an individual to have more than $2,000 in countable resources. Now let's take a look at countable resources. Towards that $2,000, uh, everything counts except these things. Social Security does not count the home that you live in or the property that might be used in a business. Uh, the items in your home, your household goods, your personal effects, your wedding rings, engagement rings, those types of uh, goods, the so Social Security does not require you to add them into the $2,000 limit. Um, if the individual with a disability has a burial plot, that's been paid for or a burial space uh, for them or their immediate family. Social Security does, also does not count that. They don't count burial funds if they're set aside uh, for the individual and the spouse. Um, both uh, the individual and the spouse, the accounts can't be more than $1,500. If a person with a disability applying for SSI has life insurance policies with more than $1,500, they would be counted. Anything uh, with a face value of $1,500 or less is not counted. One vehicle, one vehicle um, can be used, uh, is, is not counted. And there is no limit on that. Uh, there actually, I believe, used to be a limit and there was a dollar amount. Um, thankfully, they realized that some lift vans and some vehicles that uh, are adapted for someone with a disability to be able to drive uh, sometimes can be very expensive. Uh, so there is no limit on the, um, the value of that vehicle. Um, that is not counted towards that $2,000 limit. Retro retroactive payments. Um, if someone is approved to receive monthly SSI checks up to $733 a month, and they say, we approve you today, and we deem that your disability occurred six months ago, and they give you six months of back checks, if those checks would be more than $2,000, um, they won't count those. They won't count up to nine months of, of um, back payments towards that $2,000. So in other words, they won't approve you and say, here, you're approved. Here's a large check. Um, you won't get disqualified for that large check. They give you up um, to nine months. And there's also a plan to achieve self-support programs. They're called unpass programs. There are ticket-to-work programs, uh, 1619A, 1619B waivers. There are other ways that people with disabilities can actually receive Medicaid. Um, in Delaware, under the Medicaid buy-in program, a person with a disability can earn up to about $40,000 and still buy into Medicaid. Now, they wouldn't receive the SSI income check, but they could still buy into Medicaid. So uh, we don't have uh, a disincentive there uh, for someone with a disability to work. Um, they could still buy into Medicaid. So those are the non-countable resources. Everything else counts towards that $2,000 limit. These are the things that don't get counted. Now, uh, before I go forward, I just want to mention that when you're, um, if, in fact, uh, you decide that a special needs trust is something that you'd like to consider, using an attorney that has expertise in that type of planning is crucial. Um, if I was having a heart issue, my primary care doctor would say you need to go to a cardiologist. Um, and it really is the same um, with this type of planning as with special needs planning. And um, I, I certainly have attorneys um, locally that I, that I know that have worked with a lot of families. Um, if anyone needs some help on how to find 
an attorney, I can, I can certainly help them there. Now let's talk about special needs trust, and then we're going to move into uh, the ABLE Act. The special needs trust is, uh, it, it is a trust, so it's a set of instructions on how to deal with property, um, but it's different than the living trust that we talked about earlier. You know, we talked about a will and a living trust. A special needs trust is, a, is another document. It's a separate document. And uh, a special needs trust is uh, created by an attorney. The function of that special needs trust is to benefit a person who has a disability by protecting their government benefits. A special needs trust cannot replace government benefits. So let me explain what that means. Uh, someone, let's say, uh, let's say I have created a special needs trust for my daughter. And upon my passing, I say $500,000 is going to go into the special needs trust. I'm just making up numbers here. $500,000 is going to go into a special needs trust for my daughter. Let's say she also receives a monthly income from Social Security called SSI, Supplemental Security Income. Let's say that check is $500 a month. Well, a special needs trust, any money spent out of the trust must be spent after government benefits are utilized. So her $500 SSI check would have to first be spent on her rent, on her transportation, whatever that might be, um, before the special needs trust pay for that. So for example, if she saved, this would be the wrong way to plan, if she saved the $500 SSI check and put it into her savings account. And she used an and SSI is to pay for food and shelter. It's meant for food and shelter. It could pay for other things as well, um, but it's, it's classified as for food and shelter. And if she used a special needs trust to pay her rent, I said that was $600 a month, then that would actually not be an eligible expense of the trust because there's a government benefit to pay that $500 rent. In addition, Social Security would say, could say, that uh, here's, you know, we're giving $500 a month as a benefit um, to pay for that rent, and you're not using it, you're saving it, you're using something else. So if you don't need this rent, then perhaps you, this SSI, excuse me, to pay the rent, then perhaps you may no longer receive the SSI to pay the rent. So um, in, in working in this type of planning and creating these types of plans, it's important to work with people that understand government benefits, um, trust how everything uh, correlates with one another uh, so you're not inadvertently um, causing someone to lose a government benefit, um, which for people who are using a special needs trust and setting these up, their goal is to protect that government benefit. So again, uh, getting uh, good advice in this area must be spent on eligible expenses. If, for example, my daughter's special needs trust, if she wanted to go to uh, spring break in Florida, well, the special needs trust couldn't say, here, here's a check for $3,000. Go ahead and get your airline tickets and, and book your hotel room, and there's the money for food. And um, The special needs trust cannot distribute money directly to the individual who has a disability. The special needs trust can write a check or, or can pay for the airfare directly, can book the hotel, you know, the account in the special needs trust can pay for the hotel room, uh, the transportation, food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the money cannot go directly to the individual with a disability. Otherwise, it would be counted as theirs. A properly set up special needs trust does not count towards that $2,000 limit, regardless of the amount of assets that are in there. So if it's a million dollars or $20 million, you know, any amount of money in a special needs trust properly set up, properly, um, properly maintained, does not count against that $2,000 limit. So it's a vehicle that families will use to leave behind money after they're gone uh, to go into a special needs trust for that person where they can leave money to them um, if it's over $2,000, it won't cause them 
to lose their benefits that they might need, and it can still enhance their life. Okay. So, uh, so if someone has a special needs trust, they can still receive SSI, they can still receive their Medicaid, almost everything is set up properly. And the individual outside of the special needs trust does not have more than $2,000 of those countable resources, which is everything other than what was on that list that doesn't get counted. So let's move on to ABLE accounts. Before we do, um, let me just take a look at the chat box. Do we have any questions about the special needs trust? Because we're going to do um, we're going to go through the ABLE accounts and then uh, do a bit of a comparison. So before we build and, and move forward, any questions? Very good. All right, here we go, ABLE accounts. Um, it's, uh, we are excited in Delaware that uh, we should soon be seeing some legislation to create these ABLE accounts. Uh, President Obama signed the ABLE accounts into law, into law in December, and it was actually a few years in getting these ABLE accounts put together um, and passed through, um, through uh, the House and, and Congress. And um, it, it it actually, uh, when it went through, kind of at the last minute, um, a bit of the bill was removed. Um, initially, the ABLE accounts were going to be able to benefit um, any person with a disability regardless of age. And speaking of age, let me back up for a minute. A special needs trust can only be set up for an individual with a disability prior to that individual turning age 65. Um, that's an important point. So. And any individual with a disability under age 65 uh, can have a special needs trust. And if they, you know, living past age 65, they can live to be 100 and keep that special needs trust. It's just when it's created, the creation date has to be age 65 or younger. Now, with an ABLE account, um, this will allow people with disabilities, as long as their disability was diagnosed prior to age 26, uh, to create a tax exempt savings account that can be used for maintaining their health, independence, and quality of life. Now, these ABLE accounts are actually ABLE 529 plans. And if anyone is familiar with a College 529 plan, um, a College 529 plan is a plan where people can set aside funds um, for an individual's future higher learning expenses. Those accounts grow tax deferred, uh, which means that every year if there's any growth on the account, unlike in my savings account at the bank, if I have $100 of interest, well, I have to claim that $100 of interest on my tax return. With a 529 plan, any growth, you don't pay tax on that growth. And that's the same with an ABLE account. So when we say it's a tax-exempt savings account, uh, there's two pieces to that. That means every year, let's say there was $10,000 put into an ABLE account. At the end of the year, if there was $100 of interest or growth on that account, that, that $100 of growth would not be taxed. And uh, it will remain tax exempt as long as when the money is taken out, let's say we set this up for a five-year-old. At age 20, uh, the person is uh, buying a car uh, out of the ABLE account. So as long as that, uh, whatever's being spent on, is a qualified expense to be used to maintain health, independence, and quality of life, a car certainly would contribute to independence, uh, then when that money comes out, the, there is no taxation um, on, on, that, on the growth of that account when it comes out. Now, you put in after-tax money, meaning if my paycheck this week is $100, and uh, by the time taxes are taken out, I have $70. Well, I'm, I'm using money out of my $70 to put into my ABLE account. So it's after-tax money. I'm not taking an IRA or a retirement plan and putting it into an ABLE account. It's, it's money that's already been taxed. Now, um, distributions are tax-free, as I said, for disability-related expenses, housing, transportation, employment expenses, accommodations, um, assistive technology, you see the AT there, assistive technology, and others. 
uh, any any expense as, as uh, and we'll, we'll, we will get the actual regulations um, hopefully this summer here in Delaware they'll be finalized um, and we'll see more specifics but this is the general broad brush overview um, that we've received so far from the federal government now if the individual who is uh, has an able account remember they have to be under the age of 26, that the disability has to have occurred prior to age 26 and been diagnosed. Um, or if that individual uh, age 26 or younger is already receiving SSI, Supplemental Security Income, or SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, those are Social Security benefits for people with disabilities. So if someone under the age 20, of 26 is already receiving those benefits, eligibility is auto automatic. Um, so they're not going to require any other forms or documentation that the disability happened age, before age 26. Um, they know if you're receiving those benefits, then that is, in fact, the case. Otherwise, um, if they're not receiving those benefits prior to age 26, then a standard of proof of medical documentation is needed. Um, we, what we see so far is that's going to be some type of form that will go to a doctor that will certify that the disability occurred prior to age 26. And I'm getting a lot of questions um, from folks uh, that have disabilities that uh, occur later in life. Um, I can think of a few traumatic brain injuries, um, mental health issues um, that uh, sometimes occur later in life and are diagnosed after the age of 26. Um, the way that this bill was uh, sent through and passed is that those, uh, those individuals, um, as it is today, would not be eligible to use an ABLE account um, if, in fact, that disability wasn't diagnosed before age 26. Now, if someone has an ABLE account set up, so they're under age 26, they meet the definition of disability, if there is $100,000 or less in that account and the individual is applying for or already receiving Supplemental Security Income. Remember, you can't have more than $2,000. Um, I see a question. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, if that individual has $2,000 um, or less in, in resources, they can still continue to receive that SSI monthly income of up to $733 a month. So let me just say that again. If someone has $100,000 or less in an ABLE account, they can still receive their SSI monthly check. So the $100,000 is would, would be a non-countable resource, like a, an enable account, like a home, a car, wedding rings, etc. Now, if the able account has $100,000 or more, they will lose that monthly SSI income, but Medicaid eligibility can continue. So under $100,000. The person uh, under one hundred, excuse me, too much coffee. Under one hundred thousand dollars in an able account, uh, the person could, can continue or, or continue to be eligible for SSI monthly income and Medicaid because we know that if you receive SSI, you get Medicaid right away automatically. Um, if it's over one hundred thousand, they lose the monthly income but that Medicaid el eligibility can continue. Now let me get to a uh, question I see. Uh, if a child does not already receive SSI or SSDI, who uh, reviews and decides on the standard of proof? Um, today, the way the regulations are uh, broad today is that it is going to be a physician. Now what the federal government has not done is created the actual form. The we have in this country uh, a law that says that we can have ABLE accounts. Now, each state can choose whether or not they actually are going to set up ABLE accounts, and they do that by their own legislation. And that's what's actually um, that's happening right now in Delaware, where uh, the ABLE legislation is, is uh, we should be seeing a bill soon. It's being drafted probably as we speak. Um, we should see a bill soon. and. Um, then we would hope that that would get through um, the House and the Senate. If, in fact, Delaware passes a law allowing ABLE accounts, then Delawareans would be able to use a Delaware ABLE account. If an individual with a disability 
um, if that if the state where they reside has an ABLE account, they have to use the one where they live in that state. So if we do get a Delaware ABLE account um, availability, if we have legislation and we have accounts that we can invest in, a, a Delawarean with a disability would have to use the Delaware ABLE account. If for some reason, I don't see this happening, but I don't have a crystal ball. If for some reason Delaware did not pass legislation for an ABLE account, again, um, I, I, I don't see that happening. Um, but if so, the federal law says that if someone with a disability does not have ABLE account legislation and ABLE accounts in their state, they can use another state. Um, and you'll see that on the what be, or fifth bullet point down. The individual must use ABLE account in the state they reside or that provide ABLE services in their home state. Otherwise, they can use another state. So um, going back up towards the top of here, and uh, the child, I see another one. The child gives the doctor's documentation to who? We're not sure yet what that's going to look like, but I think for what we'll see is for a minor child with a disability, um, the parent or guardian would go to the doctor with the form that we will have. I don't know what it will look like, but with the form, um, the doctor would sign off to verify the, the child in your question, the disability, um, that they have a disability, and that the current card at age 26. And I imagine that's going to be something that would be submitted with the account opening paperwork. Um, but again, we're going to see how all this um, plays out and, and um, how these are both created once the, the states start putting them together specifically for us in Delaware. You're very welcome. I see you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, now, the individual with a disability, they have to be the owner of the ABLE account and the beneficiary of the ABLE account. It's very different from a special needs trust where uh, someone else is the trustee, the person with a disability is the beneficiary. So as the individual um, is the owner and the beneficiary, that means as the owner, um, they would have discretion on having access to that account. Um, total annual, annual contributions by everyone, you can't exceed more than the federal gift tax exemption amount, which is uh, necessarily have to understand what that is, but currently that number is $14,000, and typically that goes up every year, index for inflation. So total annual contributions by everyone. If my daughter set up an ABLE account for herself, um, she would be the owner and the, and the beneficiary. If she put $1,000 in, Everyone else would not be. Everyone else combined, they wouldn't be able to put in more than thirteen thousand because the maximum is fourteen thousand a year. So if I put in thirteen thousand, uh, her grandparents wouldn't be able to put anything else in that year. Now there are going to be some other. I believe there's going to be some other um, ways where uh, more can be put in. Um, maybe with a, a gift tax uh, filing. Again, yet yet to be seen. So I, I won't get too deep into that. Um, the state is responsible for uh, setting up and operating these ABLE accounts, as I said. And um, upon death, let's back up to a special needs trust for a second. A properly established, um, what we call third party, special needs trust. So I set up a special needs trust for my daughter. My money is going to go into it, not her. When I set up that special needs trust, I say, who gets the leftovers? So in other words, if there's money left over after my adult daughter's life, I've set up in that trust where that's to go. Uh, someone might name children of the individual with a disability, siblings, charities, places of worship, um, nonprofit organizations, such as Parent Information Center of Delaware, um, or other organizations close to their heart. I could just say where that goes. And upon her passing, if there's money left over, that's where that money will go. A very big difference between a special needs trust and an ABLE account is that upon the death of the person with a disability who owns the ABLE account, any amounts remaining in the ABLE account are distributed back to the state to reimburse for any Medicaid benefits that may have been received by that individual with a disability. So they don't go back. So let's say January 1st of next year, uh, someone with a disability sets up an ABLE account. And at some point in the future, there's $100,000 in there. Well, if prior to setting up that ABLE account, um, if they had 
$50,000 that Medicaid spent on their health care, um, that wouldn't be counted towards what gets kind of recouped, if you will, by the state. It's only any Medicaid benefits that are received by the individual after the ABLE account is set up, not prior to. So uh, for a child who has an ABLE account set up, you know, they're under the age of 26 for their disability occurs, their child today will stay and people set up that account. Um, when the account is set up, um, there is an accounting for what Medicaid pays. And if there's any money left over after the individual passes, then that goes back to pay the state. If there's no Medicaid benefits received, then nothing will go back to, to, the, um, to the state to reimburse Medicaid. If there were more Medicaid benefits received than what was left over in the account, let's say there was $1,000 left over in the account, but Medicaid paid $100,000. Well, they're just gonna, they're gonna just be reimbursed that $1,000 that's left. They're not gonna look for the other 99 from other family members or anything. So we'll just get back what's there um, and what they paid. So that's a big difference between the special needs trust and the ABLE account um, that families should consider um, how they might like to um, take a look at this type of planning. And then for anyone um, who is uh, as interested in the IRC as I am, the Internal Revenue Code under 326 subsection 39A is where uh, we will have um, all the legislation you can find uh, for those ABLE accounts. And there's also a link here at the bottom, and when you get the handouts, you'll see. Um, there's a link with some more information. So are there any, uh, we're wrapping up here soon. Do I have any questions about ABLE accounts? Hello, Tony. How are you today? Yes, and I will, um, I will talk to you after the workshop today. And as soon as I get something that uh, can be official and in writing, and publicized, I'll let you know um, who that representative is. Um, I, I'll wait and see uh, till that's publicized, but it is, it is actually uh, being worked on right now. Uh, what would be considered medical uh, assistance benefits, uh, Medicaid benefits? Well, Medicaid, um, thank you for your question. Uh, Medicaid can pay for a lot of different things. Um, of course, when you go to the doctor or the hospital or the therapist, uh, you would use your Medicaid card and, and they pay for those health insurance services. Sometimes Medicaid is also paying for benefits received in a school. Um, a parent doesn't have to say, I want to use my Medicaid, um, but Medicaid certainly could be paying for um, things like that. Medicaid also um, could be paying for uh, maybe a special bed that's in the home, um, other uh, uh, power wheelchair, um, other types of uh, durable medical equipment, um, anything that's coming through under Medicaid, under your Medicaid plan and what they're paying, um, that would be, um, that would, that uh, accounting would be taking place um, and then upon the death, if there's any amount remaining in the ABLE account, um, then they would be um, getting reimbursed for that. Thank you for your question. Does that answer your question? And or do I have any others? All right, thank you. All right, well, we're going to, uh, this is my entire workshop, so uh, we're not here to talk about self-determination and self-advocacy, uh, which the Parent Information Center uh, does already uh, a lot of work on with families, obviously. Where do we begin uh, with this type of planning? Well, if, what I will do, let me just give you that your hands, and I'll to you. I know the Parent Information Center has an evaluation form that they'd like you to complete for you, we'll you for that. I also have a, let's see if I can get this out to everyone. Okay, oh, and I see I missed a question. Um, I also have a uh, sign-in sheet. Where do you start? Well, my office is in Middletown, Delaware, and I offer families confidential intake meetings. I don't charge any fees uh, for intake meetings. I, um, you know, I, 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 I remember what it was like as a parent trying to get something done for my kid and not being able to get through a door or across from a window. And uh, so 10 years ago when I started this planning, um, I said I'm, I'm not going to have um, you know, a fee for a meeting be a barrier for a family to get information so they can uh, walk away and, and uh, 
you know, maybe make some decisions on, on what they'd like to do for someone or with someone as far as planning. Um, so I don't charge any fees. What I have there is an URL to an invitation, excuse me, a seminar uh, workshop evaluation, and also it's a request if you'd like to be signed up for my newsletter or if you'd like to meet for an intake meeting. That information is there. You can uh, reach me by contact on my website, and I'll also put that URL here. And all my contact information is there. Um, you can fax back, email back um, that form if you'd like. All right, now let's see. Cindy has a question, and I must have scrolled through it. Um, Cindy. Thank you. Cindy, if Medicaid benefits are less than what is in the account, what happens to the balance? The balance then would go to the beneficiary. So if there's $50,000 left over in the account, and Medicaid didn't pay anything, or maybe paid $10,000, then the remaining $40,000 after Medicaid was reimbursed, after the state was reimbursed for Medicaid, the remaining 40 or whatever was left over would go to the beneficiary that's named um, on the account. And that beneficiary would be named when the account is created. I imagine also that um, just like a college 529 plan, or other accounts, I imagine we'll be able to change beneficiaries. So, for example, if a beneficiary is set up today, and then the owner of the account, the person with a disability, decides that they'd like to change it to someone else, you know, the beneficiary to receive anything after their passing, that, that Medicaid does not get paid back, I imagine they'll be able to, to um, change that in the future, just as any owner of um, any any owner of any account. And I hope that answered your question. Do we have any, any other questions? All right, very good. There's my contact information. Carrie, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to um, give this workshop and facilitate that for your families today. Thank you. Diane, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to unmute everyone. Just the conference has been unmuted. In case anyone has any questions that they'd like to speak up, but Diane, this was wonderful. It was a great overview, and I really thank you for your time and your expertise. You're very welcome. Anytime. Okay, I'm going to end the workshop. Thank you all very much. You will be getting a follow-up email um, just asking for some feedback. Thank you all so much. Hmm.